my pleasure to introduce these speakers for, for this session. Uh, this is on the Space Club, a rather interesting rocket. And we have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Landis from Ohio Aerospace Institute at NASA Lewis over here to my right, and David Burkett will be assisting him. Uh, Dr. Landis has done research on almost every imaginable aspect of physics because, as he tells me, he has a short attention span. <laughs> only one thing at a time. And uh, David is, uh, after some time in the Air Force and other things, is finally returning to study physics seriously and is also working on this project. And with that, I think I will turn it over to these two gentlemen because we do want to finish a lot of time in about a few minutes early because they have to reset things for dinner. So there may be a limited question and answer with the operator.
Well, this is our basically the current iteration of the design. It's a canard vehicle. It's about nine meters long. That's moderately big, but it's uh, rather about the size of a typical. Yeah, okay. So it's a and that's sort of actually typical of airplanes. It's rather an airplane size vehicle. And uh, we'll talk about a little later why we have little wings on our space vehicle. It's a one person vehicle. Well, we pulled that one off and we may want to show it again. But uh, we'll go on for the moment. Now, as I mentioned, we're looking at the market niche of the very hot kit airplane. And this is comparison between uh, our vehicle, the Space Cub, and uh, one of these uh, hot kit airplanes, the, the BD-10, which is the latest version of the uh, jet aircraft from Jim B. It's uh, 717 kilograms empty weight. The Space Cub is comparable. It's about 1,200. It only carries one instead of two, which is the BD-10. But now we start looking into what makes uh, Space Cub a hot airplane. It's a Mach 7.5 vehicle. Uh, whereas the BD-10, the first supersonic kit airplane, as I believe, is a, a Mach 1.4, we also go a lot higher. Uh, and the range is actually about comparable, and the estimated cost is about comparable. So in the parts that, what basically what we're showing is that there is a market. People who want to buy the really hot kit airplane have the money. 45 of these have been sold at almost a quarter of a million dollars each. So we're talking a not insignificant market. And, uh, those are old numbers. Uh, the latest numbers I have is the number of kits sold in the B and is over 100. And uh, really, in parameters, we blow it away. So we think that there's people who would, would buy it if we uh, we already have to get out. Well, the really the most critical element for a space cub is what's going to power it. Uh, the requirements we said we wanted fuel that you can get anywhere, and the answer is kerosene and oxygen. And it's pretty much the only answer uh, if we're talking about something that you can buy at any airfield uh, in America. Kerosene, of course, is jet fuel. You can buy that at the airfield. Liquid oxygen, as it happens, is even cheaper than kerosene, and you can also buy it anywhere. Because liquid oxygen is produced in large quantities for hospitals. Uh, every hospital in America needs large amounts of oxygen, and they get it in refrigerated trucks to tank it to them. It's uh, available, it's safe, it's easily used. We need an engine that's throttleable. We need something that's restartable in flight. That is, because we're doing a um, vertical landing, we have to restart our engine. Uh, we need a very low-cost engine, and we need something with high reliability. Unfortunately, it is so far impossible to find all of these parameters in an existing engine. The approach that we are using is to take advantage of the uh, high reliability and uh, demonstrated performance of Russian rocket engines. They do fly kerosene oxygen rocket engines. And they have chambers that have flown literally thousands of flights, different engines, of course. But the design has been proven for thousands of flights. And they're reliable, low-cost engines. Let's take a look at some of the parameters. These are, as it turns out, the an important point is that for our thrust to weight to be equal to one for the single engine out, uh, we need to have multiple engines, and really these are our, our choices. And there's two engines that we're looking at very specifically. There's the Vernier engines on the RD-107, that's the old Soyuz launcher, and the Vernier engines on the RD-120, which is the Zenith second stage engine. What are Vernier engines? Vernier engines are the tiny little engines. You should have a picture a little bit. It's pretty around, right? are the tiny little engines on the side of the main chambers that are used as uh, basically steering engines. Here's an RD-107. This is the common old uh, Soyuz Vostok launcher. And they're pretty big engines. What else? What else? What else? What else? You're right. Uh, these are the little burningers. This is about a meter long. So they're small engines. 
if we use one of these things, these are the objects that put uh, multi ton spacecraft into orbit. They're far too big for our, uh, our needs. But these little burners are just about what we want. Uh, maybe we can go back then to the uh, previous. Uh, and we really have the two choices if we want to moderate a number of engines. If we want a huge number of engines, we could do a small reaction control engine at uh, a little bit under 1,000 pounds per engine. But really, we want an engine that's somewhere between the, the 5 to 7,000 pound thrust range. And the, these are the two choices. The same, by the way, the Ukrainian rocket. Uh, the Soyuz only a Vostok is a, a Russian rocket. Uh, and this, by the way, is the world's most used rocket engine. 12,000 of these chambers have been flown. Chambers. Uh, so in comparison, you know, why don't we use American engines? And the problem is that American engines are either way too big, like the Atlas engine, or way too small. Here's some, uh, the only two American engines that are in the class range that we're looking at. Uh, the Atlas MA5 uh, for an air, it's a single start engine, but it's only got, it's only 500 pounds, it's too small an engine. We need 35 of them if we were uh, going to fly our engine off of these, and they weigh 24 kilograms each. Uh, a little bit bigger engine, a thousand pound engine, is the Delta Vernier, uh, also made by Rocketdyne, but we still need 18, and that's too many. Uh, and that's a 21 kilogram engine, so a pretty heavy engine. They're, yeah, they're too heavy. Also, however, they're too expensive. Uh, so we do have a engine that looks like it's reasonable. In fact, we have a choice of engines, both the Ukrainian and the Russian uh, kerosene oxygen burning engines. Uh, the other thing that I'm sure you were asking is, why did we put wings onto a space vehicle? Uh, if it's a rocket to go off, why do we put wings on it? Well, the reason is, uh, even though we are landing vertical, we're not uh, gliding into a landing, the critical design limitation was when we hit the atmosphere again, uh, we're coming in from almost Mach 8, and to keep the pilot alive and functioning, we have to minimize the G-loading. And uh, we put a design limit of 3.5 Gs, and to do this, the best way to do this is the trajectory we need with, uh, and that allows us to dissipate the uh, reentry velocity and also sort of lower the peak heating of my other criteria. We looked at a lot of drag solutions also. We looked actually at air, air, air brakes. Uh, we did not look at balloons. I'm not sure if we could. No, the answer is the trouble is very few things uh, work in Mach 8 don't, that um, meet our other direct design criteria. The problem with the suborbital vehicle is that it comes in a lot more steeply than a, an orbital vehicle. And orbital vehicles come in like about one degree below horizontal pole. This thing comes in between 12 and 45 degrees, or depending on your upward trajectory, if you're trying to max altitude. You're going straight up, which means you're coming straight down. You could come back. So this is the angle it means you, get, you tend to dig, dig, dig deeper into the atmosphere and get heavier atmosphere at higher speeds. It means you get, get higher G-loads. You, you need a good lift to drag to be able to pull out of that dive and dissipate your heat in the upper atmosphere. This is just looking at some of the, the overall size, uh, which we talked about a little bit in the uh, configuration geograph. Again, it's uh, a little bit over a ton. It carries a pilot and very little else. And it needs a lot of pump. You can't do a, actually, we didn't really talk about the main mission for Space Cub. I guess we pushed that toward the end. But the point of Space Cub was to make a vehicle that would go into space and go into space with a, a significant margin. Uh, we are not aiming at orbit. Orbit is very difficult. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But we did want something that a, an ordinary person can go into space 
turn their answer that way. Uh, as I understand it, the Society of Experimental Test Pilots automatically qualifies anyone who goes higher than 50 miles. Space Cup will do it. Anybody who goes one can automatically become a member. Well, so you get space up. Uh, by a, a good margin at the maximum altitude, that's straight up. In fact, the nominal flight profile is, uh, I believe, now 45 degree angle. Yeah, go. Uh, yeah. okay. Anyway, it's a uh, Mach 7.5 vehicle, and it's under half an hour worth of flight, but it's a, it's a hot vehicle. It's actually, however, moderately uh, easy on the pilot. It's a 3G liftoff max, and that's, uh, of course, as you burn away your fuel, or a little lower than that. And depending, it's 1.5 to 8.5 Gs uh, acceleration on as you come into the atmosphere. The eight and a half is if you go straight up, meaning you're coming straight down, and you have to pull out real hard if you want to keep running out of sky. <laughs> Actually, maybe we should. Would you like to do, uh, do the talking for a while? Yeah, I'll pull you guys. Um, squat 
mechanical type design. Um, another way I like to, put, like to describe it was this is a Gemini capsule on steroids. Um, and then the problem, that problem ran into a number of problems, including the re-entry. We needed to, after everything else had been eliminated, we pretty much ended up having to do a lifting re-entry and just couldn't get a high enough lift and drag ratio on that. So it's a lifting body design, which you see right here. Um, this one, and it still has the best aerodynamics of every design we have. It came even with the best lift and drag, the best flight characteristics. It had only one problem, almost impossible to manufacture. Uh, as it fit in the Dozens of small tanks inside to hide it to fill the space. Um, complex compound occurs on the upper surface, and it just it just got to the point where it just wasn't possible for a uh, home builder to really do it before we needed that. So we went with the wing version. Started with the delta, a uh, delta wing design that, uh, as you can see, the, the wire bearing drawing here I used for aerodynamic studies. Um, this one had pretty good characteristics. Until I started doing CG analysis and stability characteristics, and found it had this natural tendency of trying to swap ends in flight. I wanted to fly it backwards, so we couldn't use that one. So I had to start turning the wings, uh, changing the CG arrangements, and then we went with the. Um, it's a truth and intermediate here with that one. Yes, yeah, so we uh, trim off a little bit of the wing tip and some other things there. Uh, change the those kind of a little bit. But same basic problem with this one as with the other one is that it still tends to swap ends. So uh, that's when we uh, do the same thing. So we went with the uh, early version. Um, it was pretty, getting pretty close to what the current version here. Uh, changed the wing design a little bit. Well, you can change wings by a lot, pull to the cord back. Um, and this worked fairly well at the supersonic and hypersonic. It remained stable. It kept the nose first. It kept the lift, um, lift and drag where we wanted them to be. The aerodynamics weren't quite as good. It had uh, not as good a lift and drag ratio, which meant higher accelerations during re entry and higher heating. But both were still acceptable. So, however, problems were arising. We started looking at the very, as it changed from hypersonic. The supersonic, the subsonic, is a lot of the aerodynamic characteristics change. Particularly, the aerodynamics center moves, you lose, in the subsonic regime, you lose a lot of the body lift that you get with the supersonic, so we had to uh, go with one final change, which took care of that. Uh, Don't forget yeah. controllability. In controllability, we needed, uh, our, with the other version, the spoilers and uh, we use the spoilers top and bottom on the <coughs> wings and vertical surfaces. The, um, they were too close to the center of gravity to get controllability. They were too short a moment on So we had to put the canard up here, which involved sweeping the length and the vertical tail a little more. And basically, I didn't even do the drawing groups. I just changed the old drawing. So that's why it's still version 3 here. Version 3A, call it. Um, and this one, we got the we finally put the air in where we wanted to be. Only problem now is it's a little bit overweight. <laughs> so I've got to start working on doing and turning away from it. But we're still, it looks like we're pretty close to a final design on this here at this point. I want to go to orbit. <coughs> yeah, so do I. Um, in case you didn't hear, Jeff said he wanted to go to orbit. But um, trouble is, getting to orbit is tough. With uh, kerosene oxygen and fuel, you need a mass ratio of 20 to 25. That means for every pound that burn out, you need 20 to 25 pounds sitting on the launch pad, or your takeoff apron, or whatever you want to call it, or something like this. Um, that means basically 95% of your takeoff weight is fuel. More, actually, since you're going to need to reserve some fuel for landing. Uh, we thought that was a little too much to expect at home builders at the time being. However, the space cup, with its double, total depth of vehicle only 4,300 meters per second, although a lot of that is used up in um, vertical climb against gravity and tight atmospheric drag, we only get a top speed of about 2,500 meters per second. A space cup only needs a mass ratio of about six, which seems to be entirely um, 
available to, to techniques available to home builders and hobbyists. So that gets us there. However, that this isn't the end the end of the story. I think we should have the next one we're going next. Well, the rest of the story, how we're going to what, why we get from here. See, there, the, the space cup isn't the end in itself. It's a starting point. Um, build larger and more, more higher performance vehicles. Um, there's a family rocket. I've already done some basic, real basic conceptual stuff on that. It should be like a um, two plus two, kind of a Cessna 172 type thing. Okay. Two adults, two kids can go up about. 600, 700 mile ranges, um, a little bit faster than the space cup, using many of the same components as the space cup. Some changes in fuse logs and fuel tank arrangements to give it more propellant and a larger payload area. The next step might be a business rocket. Might go with this one, we'd probably be a production vehicle, so we can go back to the lifting body design, which would give us better aerodynamics. Um, Use uh, more advanced composite structures, things made possibly aluminum lithium tanks to get better max ratios. It's be like a thousand mile range vehicle for uh, about eight passengers. Um, the ultimate for the businessman who wants to be there yesterday. Then this was this is this is Jeff's little edition, the Euro rocket. Um, kind of New York to Paris in an hour and a half tops. Including the lift off. <laughs> <laughs> including, including time waiting in line at the gate. Um, more people start flying vehicles like the Space Cub. There will be markets for add ons and upgrade kits. Um, might be possible for instance to just, set, just sell engines to people who want to do their own aircraft experiment. People experiment. Um, people can be more, become more familiar with rockets and be more familiar with what is involved in space flight and suborbital flights. Uh, experimenters, you can have your Berber Rutans and Jim Beatties for spacecraft. And the result would be um, new developments in a wide variety of fields, a lot of competition, people pushing past each other, trying to get more and better. And it'll eventually lead to the development of four wheel vehicles. Um, and the thing about it is, you don't have to make the big step all to orbit all at once. You make it little steps, a little at a time. Each step being profitable and making money all along the way. Uh, some some um, GLE calculations I did I did on the Model Two and Model Three family spacecraft, as you can see, has about half again the takeoff weight of the space cup, a little bit more mass ratio, a little bit more range, uh, three four times the payload capacity. The executive capacity. Transport the um, corporate jet type version, a little larger, about uh, two and a half to three times as, as heavy. Again, longer range and more passengers and more payload. Getting an FAA certification on these, however, is left as an exercise for the imagination. <laughs> well, by the time you get these, all they'll have been used to the idea of space cup, which is the whole idea. Space cup is the one that breaks the ground. The advantage of an experimental kit-built airplane is that the FAA type certification is far easier. Now it matters. Yes, they are not cheap. <coughs> not as bad as you might think, but they're not cheap. You um, go into space for 600 bucks. Also, I think you start to So, this is just the fuel cost. Um, actually, the fuel cost is probably going to be the main driver of operations. Well, assuming you do your own in general. Assuming you do your own. <laughs> <laughs> well, the flip side is also how often are the engines going to be overhauled? Because the baseline of operations, the engines start at 70%, about 70-80% power. You never run the engines at full power. So you're running them a lot less than their design rate. And a lot less than they designed about our time here. Typically, for a, a vehicle, you get this class fuel cost, kind of, kind of the cost of the uh, vehicle itself, the amortizing, and how common and so forth. The fuel cost is probably about 20%. Well, airlines generally operate.
operate at about three times the fuel cost. However, a lot of that is overhead to people who do things that have nothing to do directly with the operation of the aircraft. People like people who do things like sell tickets, which don't really aren't direct cost to the airline, but they're things that are part of the total cost picture of like airline operations. So, and also airliners tend to have to fit with the much more stringent uh, certification practices than do um, vehicles like experimental type aircraft vehicles. It's really a question of how much you can do yourself and how much you have to pay on mechanics to do. And I don't think we can really answer that. There's not very many rocket engine mechanics that are around at the moment mm -hmm. that have the price of space. Okay, um, can we catch a few more of these questions or move on? See. I don't know, why don't we show this one and then we have performance envelopes. Okay, this is a little dated here. The component max breakdown is kind of a little dated. Like I said, we're overweight and I could have done a more detailed breakdown since this was made. Um, for one thing, I'm looking very seriously at dropping the air supply and just bleeding off from the oxygen. Some people don't like that idea, and I don't know. It might be worth it for the weight. But um, it gives you some idea of how the, where the weight goes. The big chunk of it is just in the skin of the vehicle. Um, we haven't really talked about the structure, but it needs to be a moderately high temperature capable structure, although not really a, a hugely high temperature capable structure. Because we're only in the, the high temperature regime for a relatively short period of time. But we are looking at titanium uh, for the external portions and uh, probably a nose tip out of carbon is relatively easy to do. And those are things we can, and the, the nose tip we can, and maybe possibly wing and tail leading edges uh, can be pre, pre manufactured and sold, sold as part of the kit. The trick, of course, is that all the titanium is just sheet. We don't actually have to form titanium. And you can buy titanium sheet relatively cheaply if you have to forge and make complex curves with titanium. Now you're talking a much more expensive process. That looks like the spar, the unfortunate part there. <laughs> but, um, but again, it's that probably something that would be factory manufactured and sold as part of the kit. Have you done any uh, modeling of any of like the uh, physical vibration characteristics? Not at this point, no. We've um, talked about it in great detail. We've done, we've done a lot of aerodynamics modeling, but none of the we have done flutter modes and keeps the vibration as we can. How will this aircraft, when you come in for a landing, how is this aircraft going to land? Okay, it's going to be a vertical landing. Um, basically, the way they're coming in, uh, I've designed the amount of fuel around to let you pull it, to make, you make the landing over a thousand feet. So you have lots of airspace for if you miss, if you miss one approach, you can try again. Pull up into a stall at uh, dead zero airspace and then airspeed and then come down tail first. All right, what? Okay, so what you're proposing is the engine will start up uh, to keep it from hitting the ground. Right, you start the engine before you do the, uh, the zero airspeed. You start, the, you start the engine up in an idle mode and you throttle up when you hit the you hit vertical. All right, what, what happens if the engine doesn't start? You have three engines. All of them have to fail to start to keep you down. One of the designs figures I put on there is that the engine is to be able to land on one engine. You only need one engine to land, which put a lower limit on, on the thrust available for each engine. Keep in mind you're very light coming into land because you've burned off a heck of a lot of fuel. However, even if none of your engine's light, the worst case, uh, it has no landing gear, but you can do a glide landing on the belly, which will probably... The vehicle fall. will not survive, but you probably yeah, will. The vehicle won't survive. It'll, <laughs> it'll rip the belly open. But the pilot is intended to be able to survive that landing. So the worst case, the pilot survives. What about any kind of uh, pilot ejection system? We've talked we've about, about that, too. We've talked about it probably for the prototype. Almost certainly for the prototype. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's pilot's Yes, uh, one thing I've looked at, they have a ejector seat now available for home-built type aircraft, which is basically, it's a, it's a rocket that tows the pilot out of the vehicle. The rocket passes to a harness which tows the pilot out of the vehicle. Basically, yeah. <laughs> the guy said airborne bungee jumping. So yeah, basically. Um, so that would be, you know, the ability to escape in those kinds of situations. 
in most situations where you would want to eject, you're better, you're actually better off staying with the vehicle. Anyway, uh, this is why most uh, general aviation people don't wear parachutes. You just, not, almost always, you're better off staying with the vehicle. The numbers we want. That, that is another possibility um, as an emergency system. These will probably be options available to kit builders. If you get that, you'd have to dump your fuel, and that may not, there may not be a great way to do that. You might be able to do it like as an emergency, as an emergency option for, for the landing part. Um, but again, I wouldn't make these standard on it. They might be available as options for kit builders. Anything a kit builder wants, I'm likely to make available if they want it. <laughs> you just got to pay me for it. As far as uh, uh, sort of the tip, uh, what kind of tanks are you generating? Inflation and stuff like that. Uh, is that a big expense? Or the, tanks will be made out of, the tanks will be made out of aluminum, uh, fairly low pressure, 50 psi, just to get the power to the pump system, just get the uh, propellant to the pump system. Uh, aluminum works fine for uh, cryogenics. Um, and liquid oxygen, you don't really need much in the way of insulation unless you're going to sit on the sit on the pad for a week. The point of insulation, in fact, is to keep the frost from building up on it. Uh, we don't have enough insulation to keep the liquid oxygen cold uh, for long periods in the pad. Uh, you just boil off, and the boil off is your Actually, actually, many airports have liquid oxygen available. I have been told by a friend of mine who is an aerospace engineer and works with the Air Force right now that many airports have liquid oxygen available there. I'm not sure what they use it for. I don't work at an airport, so I don't know. But that is what I'm told is there. It is available. It can be, it can be shipped by truck. I've called a place down in Akron and said, how much? It said 35 cents a gallon. Delivered. <laughs> Basically, you call a, any industrial gas supply place and say, I want the tank of liquid oxygen. I have no idea. Uh, this gentleman back here has been waiting for a very long time. Um, I uh, assume you're pointing at me. Um, I want to suggest a possible way around the FAA, uh, the FAA certification if that proves to be a problem. You might consider leaving your jurisdiction horizontally because since you're giving the Russians all this business buying their engines anyway, I wonder if they might set up a kind of a tourist arrangement where experimental well, flying enthusiasts can come to outside the area. The problem is, is once you start, once you, the um, actual, the air, aircraft part of the flight, the initial test flights, should not be a problem. Experimental, there's experimental rules for um, aircraft, experimental home built type stuff, are actually fairly lenient. You can work within them. The problem is going to come when we start going into, going into actual the space flight portions of the operations. And right now, the law as I've written, it applies to Americans even if it flies someplace else. So if you, if you go and you do it, don't come back. Well, the FAA does have a portion of the FAR to man rockets. There's nothing in this portion. Uh, yeah, you mean they just have a number of they have a, Right, there's a, a rule section for man rockets. Which is blank. It's which is blank. <laughs> but they do assert no authority over 50,000 feet. So it's just zero to 50,000 feet. The FAA asserts authority over it. Above that, we can do what we want. Unless other agencies come after us, which is a good question. Here, here, I've had a number of meetings on the FAA and with the Department of Commerce, I was like, I'm on the Constitution on the X-Prize, which is activities. Right now, the rules and regulations are following. Uh, FAA asserts authority for 60,000 people. The top 60. 60 is top class in the airspace. Anything that has a rocket engine on it, they will not put jurisdiction over. It goes directly to DOT. DOT right now is a hang-up in terms of uh, uh, anything that carries a human on board that has a that flies is going to require a DOT license. And uh, this, this discussion now is the companies that are going to be going to the spacecraft that category is, is probably the single most important thing. To get the community to focus on supporting because if there is there's an issue we have to deal with. The FAA is going to 
bounce it directly off. Um, I've been talking about that on Usenet and on my information list and the need to like that, so yes. Yeah, this, is, this is another one that we've talked about a lot without reaching conclusions. I am not convinced. I think that if it's in the FAR, they have a number for it, that means that it's FAA responsibility. Um, yeah, so. I'm just telling you right now, it's usually 6,000 feet, FAA has nothing to do with it, they'll turn it over to you. This gentleman in back here, what, what are the costs like for the engines? We don't know yet. I've been in contact with the, um, the Nergo Machine makes the RD-107. Um, I have not heard back yet from them, and it's been a while. And in the meantime, I've been looking at some preliminary stuff as, just in case I stuff in case we have to develop our own engines. I mean, However, you can put boundaries on it. You can buy a Soyuz for $15 million. Okay, you can remove the, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the 12 verniers from it, and then sell the remainder of the Soyuz to a museum or somewhere. Uh -huh. But you can guess how much they ought to be producing them for, considering they, they produce them by the many hundreds per year. Are the verniers basically for mind control of attitude? Yes. Yes, the, these Russian vehicles do not have gimbaled engines. The Russians in their early vehicles didn't. The Americans and the Russians went different routes to how, how to control uh, how to control rockets. They did not gimbal them. Instead, they put these little bitty chambers on the side of the main engines. And it's those little bitty chambers that happen to be just the right size. Well, actually, the, um, the, the um, RD-107 engine is of the same generation as the early Atlas IV yeah. missiles, which also use which also Bernier's. Bernier's. So, um, the, the difference is that the, we, they pretty much kept the same design, incrementally improving it over time. Um, yes? Uh, what would be the effect on the surface you're taking off from? Take off this compare concrete? Um, we think so. We're not really sure yet. That's one of the things that have to be tested. It might be possible, however, after, but we looked at the possibility I've considered the possibility of maybe having installing in the tail end of a water tank that would spray water into the exhaust to keep to prevent erosion. Uh, 120 liters or so would absorb the energy for the first 10 seconds, and by that point, you're far enough above that you're not a problem. Or alternatively, you get fire hoses from the uh, and the air base, and you know, fire hoses are something that airfields often have around. What would be the noise level? It will be loud. <laughs> it will be approximately 20 decibels uh, less loud than an Atlas takeoff. Yeah. On the other hand, oh, but from theoretical considerations, again, I don't know the particulars of these engines. Yeah. I don't have decibel values for them. You can, theoretical you can guess, though, like. that it will be like a jet of comparable size, of comparable thrust, and that it's going to be quieter than, than a 747, which has more thrust. No. So, but that's a guess. We have, we have five times. Oh, well, no, these are just more graphs that we have in case anybody asks the detailed questions instead of just these general questions. Yes. Well, a couple of questions. First, if you don't really know how much the engines are going to cost, how do you come up with your estimated cost? Um, yes, no, it's, it's a guess. It's largely a guess. Based it's, large guess, guess. it's based, lo based loosely on a component count, the size and complexity. Um, I've used a couple of different things, like a weight model, a weight-based model for cost. Um, used part uh, compound-based models. They come up with about that value. The um, engines are the big unknown in that, and we're totally upfront. The engines are a big unknown. So, but on the other hand, the V tens cost is less engines than avionics. A complete follow-up aircraft is about half a million dollars. So we've got a lot of leeway in there that before we start running into it being prohibitively expensive. But the engines are the big hole in the tank, the big unknown. If they come out being a million dollars a piece and you need five of them, it's not going to be a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You, you think you need one R D one oh seven version per No, I believe it was the value was three. No, three. three for that. Three. Right. Or five uh, RD one twenty version. Okay. The, the second question that arises is that since this is a single person vehicle, that means by definition that everybody who straps into it for the first time is an instant 
that's part of it. Now, what kind of, of uh, training can possibly prepare the average pilot to do a, a, a very, uh, what looks to me like a pretty difficult profile to fly successfully the first time? Okay. You must um, have virtual reality talk before this one. Actually, there's several things involved there. First off, the in part and parcel of the thing, part of our test program will be developing um, simulator software that will help get, get familiar with the flight characteristics. Um, in fact, if you're familiar with um, the late Captain Milt Thompson wrote a book at the edge of space about the X-15 program, the consensus of what when the test pilots there was a combination of centrifuge time and um, simulator experience was considered sufficient for a competent pilot to be able to fly the X-15. We have better, we'll have better software, we'll have better stability control, we'll have better electronics, um, better pilot augmentation through, through computers, that, so that it should be it's the same case for us. Also, we can, we can do a remote downlink, have a instructor pilot operating a remote link on the ground to take over if necessary during, che during checkout flights. Um, it's also possible to automate to the point where the first pilot has to do nothing more than just push a button and let the, flight, and let the vehicle take over. Well, that's basically what I was going to ask. Um, that, will, that is also an option that's being looked at. It, it depends on the level of software and sophistication we want to develop. Well, you mentioned average pilot. I would think... No, I said competent pilot. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I consider myself to be a competent pilot, but I know the difference between myself and a test pilot, and I think a competent pilot and a competent test pilot are... Competent pilot, pilot in this case is the guy who's going to go, is the guy who's going to go and spend 100 hours or so in high-performance aerobatic aircraft to check out for it. No. It's not the guy who only sets them 72 times, just straps on a BD-10 and then crashes. No, you really would want to spend time in the simulator strapping yourself into the uh, to the space cup. You would want to spend a lot of time in the simulator and run through a lot of different contingencies. But the attempt is to develop a pretty good simulator that uh, is an actual in in all all of the responsibilities. This gentleman over here, the follow on You're a rocket, that's what it is. And, and the result might be that then you can have 300 passengers that are going to fly the Although it seems to me like the key, you know, there's a now the key to the NASA's I don't think that the 2 to 300 version is really viable any time in, in the near future <coughs> simply because of operating costs at that point is the rather high per, per seat mile. Um, however, for small packages, for people who are really in a hurry, people who fly the Concorde now would probably fly the Euro rocket. Um, and probably would have, it probably would cost about the same. So I guess, I got cold, we're out of time. Uh, so I think we could probably continue in the hallway. This has been a very interesting but we have to clear the room for reset. So thank you very much.